Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for March 4th, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to this at CircuitPythonista's Discord role. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this doc document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend uh, or don't want, wish to speak, you can, add, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the documents for us to read during the meeting. The meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a quantitative over overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. Third is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. The fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions come out of stat of, can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. With that, we'll get started on community news after I take a timestamp here. Turned on the markdown. <laughs> markdown makes it go away. Google Docs has markdown support, which means it follows the formatting, but it doesn't leave the markdown marks in it, which is annoying. OK. Uh, anyway, <laughs> community news is a chance for us to give a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. I picked two Python things related out here. Uh, first is uh, that. The Raspberry Pi celebrates 12 years. Happy birthday to Raspberry Pi on uh, February 29th. They're a leap year baby. Technically, it's their third birthday. They've sold 61 million units as of their anniversary. They celebrated by having their in-house maker, Toby, whip up projects with Raspberry Pi Pico W, NeoPixel LEDs, and MicroPython. Uh, check a link there to Raspberry Pi News and also to Tom's Hardware and the Adafruit blog. Next up. The PyCon US 2024 talks uh, schedule has been released. Uh, several talks and tutorials involve Python on hardware. Um, three highlighted here are, is one is open source robotics with Python. Learn robotics with no robot required by Kat Scott. Uh, our own Jeff Epler has a connecting old to new with CircuitPython, retro computer input devices on modern PCs. And then lastly, we have Introduction to MicroPython, Getting Started with the BBC Microbit by Juliana Caroline D'Souza at PyCon in Pittsburgh in June, May, May, June, I think May. Um, all right. Uh, it's in May. Thanks, Jeff. 
Uh, newsletter details. The Python on Microcontrollers Weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are at www.adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub uh, sum and submit a pull request with the changes. You may also email cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> all right, and that's it for community news. Thanks to Ann for putting all that good stuff together. Uh, next up, we have the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a chance for us to take a hopefully objective, more statistical uh, uh, look at the health of the larger CircuitPython project. Uh, I'll go over the overall and core, and then we'll hand it off to some folks for the other pieces. So overall, we had 60 pull requests merged from 15 different authors, which is awesome. Some new names to me are Mark Camp, Stancy, uh, Analogic is new to me, Sean Chain W is new to me, uh, Mario Suila, Mario Pesh uh, are all new to me as well. Uh, overall, we had seven reviewers, um, so thank you to all of our reviewers, and we had 17 closed issues by eight people and 13 open by 12 people, so we're net down four. And you know we're getting a high single digits, uh, low double digits for folks being involved. So that's great as well. Next we have the core. Taking another time code. So in the core we had six pull requests merged from five different authors, which is awesome as well. Uh, and the same new names that I said. We had two reviewers. Uh, 21 open pull requests, uh, which is well under our 25 single page goal, so that's good. Uh, many of these are drafts as well. Um, we have five closed issues by three people and seven, o o seven opens by six people, so we're net up two, uh, for a total of 673 open issues. Uh, we use milestones to track prioritization for Adafruit funded folks. Um, and 82x is our current stable branch, and there are no open issues there. Um, I don't know if we plan on doing one more release there or not. Um, we have 12 open issues for 9.0. This is where we're putting a lot of our focus right now to get 9.0 stable. We have 20 open issues for 9xx. Um, those are the ones that we want to do soon after, um, or as part of like the post 9.0 launch. Uh, we also have one issue not assigned a milestone as of the, when these stats were taken, so we'll just need to, it's really common for over the weekend, we just need to make sure we triage things. Um, I'd be worried if that was more than 10. And with that, let's go to Foamy Guy for an update on the libraries. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, this section covers all of the CircuitPython libraries, which are Python-level code that helps you either interact with certain bits of hardware like driver libraries or uh, the other main class that we have are helper libraries that just allow you to create your project um, at a higher level without having to worry as much about some of the uh, intricate details involved. All these libraries can be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and then the name of whatever library it is. Uh, across all those libraries this week, we had uh, loads of pull requests, 50 pull requests merged this week from uh, eight authors. Uh, a couple of the names that are newer or less familiar to me, uh, so these folks might be newer contributors or less frequent contributors, thanks uh, to Mark Camp, Danzi, and Analogic uh, this week. The rest of the names were more familiar to me. Uh, we had seven reviewers, um, so thank you to all of our reviewers, including uh, Tectric, Scott, Brent, myself, Dan, Liz, and Maker Melissa. Um, of our pull requests this week, uh, we did have uh, quite a few of uh, the older ones. We had one over 300 days, one at 200 days, and two at 100 days, and then a, a small handful, less than 100 days, and a few dozen that were just open for a single day, all as part of the uh, connection manager updates, which I'm sure we will hear uh, a little bit more about throughout the meeting. Um, 
that leaves us with 54 pull requests open. Uh, the oldest one, uh, I believe, is a draft, and it's 564 days. The newest one is just one day. Uh, in uh, regards to issues for the last week, we had nine issues closed by six people with four new issues opened up by four people. That leaves us with 737 open issues, and there are 19 of them that are labeled good first issue. You can find those 19 and more over at circuitpython.org contributing, which is the place that you should head if you are interested in contributing on the Python side of things to CircuitPython. Uh, on that page, you'll find a list of open PRs as well as open issues. Um, if you're looking to contribute, that's a good place to start. Uh, you can get started with reviewing. Uh, if you look at the list of open PRs, you can take a look at those PRs, look at the code. Uh, if you have hardware, you can test it out. Uh, leave a comment on the issue, letting us know that you tried it out or took a look at it and what you found. Once you uh, get the hang of that, we can get you leveled up to be on the official review team. If you'd like to actually start uh, getting your hands dirty, contributing code and things as well, you can uh, bounce over to the Issues tab, take a look at the open issues, find one that you've got some hardware for, and uh, start working on that and submit a PR in order to solve it, if you can. Um, we do have guides for contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. We also have lots of folks who are available on the Discord who are willing to help you get started. So we want everyone to be able to contribute uh, no matter what skill set or background or anything like that. Uh, we're always going to be willing to help you get started if that's what you want to do. Uh, rounding out the uh, library stats for the week, we've got the PyPI stats. So there were uh, 129,726 PyPI downloads across the 325 uh, libraries. The top 10 list is here, uh, and the libraries that were updated this week look like uh, Pi Camera, Connection Manager, ESP32 Spy, and Requests. Uh, these are the ones listed here, but I think um, there probably are a number of others that were related to Connection Manager. Anything that deals with the network likely was updated this week. Uh, so that's what we've got for libraries. Thanks. Thanks, Bummy Guy. All right, next up, let's go to Maker Melissa for an update on Blinka. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. This week we had four pull requests merged by three authors and two reviewers. There are, there are currently a total of nine open pull requests amongst other repositories. There were three closed issues by one person, two open by two people, uh, leaving a net of 85 open issues. There are, or there were 15,160. And we are at 129 boards. And that is it. Thanks, Melissa. All right, let's go on to Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a, kind of the opposite of this objective view. This is a subjective view uh, of the help of the project. A chance for, to thank folks for what they're doing within Circuit Python land or even abroad. Uh, this is great for just recognizing the folks that are doing awesome work and also reinforcing the things that we value as a community. So I will start and then we'll go through the list in the notes doc. I will read folks off if they're marked as text only. So first for myself, uh, hug report to SCUR for testing I2S on 9.0 builds. Hug to Justin for following up with all of the connection manager changes, and also a hug to TAC for fixing tiny USB for me. And next up is Dan. Okay. Um, thanks to Scott for several technical conversations over the past week. We had one just a few minutes ago. Um, thanks to Justin. Um, in addition to all the connection manager stuff that he was working on uh, over the weekend, we he was trying to use up and noticed there were some problems with it. And there was a problem with the Pi, the source, the, the library bundle that was source code. It didn't include version information. And that actually broke sometime a couple of months ago. And so we fixed that and then also fixed another issue having to do with CircUp updates that I need to merge in. Thanks to Marius Zvikla, who um, added a pull request to um, Circuit Python that was approved to set the USB HID interface name 
because it was fixed at CircuitPython space HID, uh, but a lot of people wanted it to be something different for their own keyboards or whatever. And this is a feature that has long been asked for, and it's great that we have that now. And thanks to Foamy Guy, who over the past week or so, I've had a whole bunch of interactions with about infrastructure and debugging and all kinds of things. I really appreciate your uh, help. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Next up, I have notes from DJ Devon 3. After I take a time code, DJ Devon uh, says, Justin, hug report to Justin and all the developers that worked on getting Connection Manager merged. I'm excited to start a project and look into it soon. Hug report to Harebrain and Lady Ada for answering some questions about chip select lines need, needing pull up resistors. Lastly, hug to Skur for making me aware that the Raspberry Pi CM4 modules and their add on boards are no longer hard to come by. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thank you. Uh, hard reports for me this week, uh, echoing what a couple of folks have said. Thanks to Justin for continued effort on the connection manager, as well as uh, follow-up changes surrounding that. Um, thanks to Dan for reviewing and merging uh, many of those changes across the libraries. Um, thanks to Liz for testing out an issue that popped up on the Feather DVI and submitting a fix for that. Um, thanks to uh, user Bear over on Discord uh, for patiently offering help and suggestions during a live stream when I was struggling to understand. Um, thanks to Tyeth for testing out the web workflow support proposed for Circup. Uh, thanks to uh, James J. Nadau. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that uh, improperly or not. I apologize if so, but uh, thanks to them on uh, GitHub for adding the M5 card pewter support to the CircuitPython repo. Uh, as well as posting some steps uh, elsewhere online for how to flash the bootloader so that you can get that loaded. And then lastly, thanks to Jeff for reviewing some of my PRs in the Pi Camera library. Thanks. Thanks, Holy Guy. Next up is Jeff. Hello. Today, I just have a group hug. Thanks, Jeff. And Jerry. And another group hug. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. All right, next up, I have notes from Justin, who says, uh, hug report to Brent, Dan, and Tan Newt for reviewing and merging all my PRs. And now it's time to hear from Liz. Hello, uh, hug reports to Dan, H, and Tan Newt for continuing the fight against CircuitPython 9 bugs. Foamy Guy for assisting with a Feather DVI issue that popped up. Jepler for having done a few CircuitPython OpenAI projects on Learn that made my most recent guide a little easier to get started with, and a group hug. Thanks, Liz. And now for Maker Melissa. Um, I just had a group hug for everyone. Thanks, Melissa. And Mark, are you around? All right, I'll read Mark's off. Not voice. Okay, no problem. Uh, hug report to Jepler for a birthday project I idea he gave me last year that just popped up as a phone reminder. And now uh, from Toddbot, we have a group hug. That's it for hug reports. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next up is status updates. Um, I should, I don't know if I said it, but we do this as a round robin. So give everybody a chance to speak up. I will start as an example and we'll go through the list of folks in the notes doc, um, just like last time. But this time we wanna hear about what you've been working on in the past week and what you plan on working on in the coming week. Um, okay, let me take a time code and I'll go. So for me, I was mostly out last week with a sick Ari, my son. Uh, he's doing better and at daycare today. Uh, I did fix the read the docs build that I think Anik Data discovered that was wrong and then Dan was looking at it too. It was accidentally building the Microlab docs instead of the CircuitPython ones. Um, I disabled uh, warning printing during tab complete, so that fixes an issue that um, Bill88T filed, I think. There's a PR out that I think just got merged to make file system writes work when not connected to USB. And I actually, I take that back. I don't think it was uh, filed. We got to figure that out. That might be an in the weeds topic. Um, I started debugging an RGB matrix crash due to the interrupt watchdog not having, uh, but I haven't found the issue yet. Dan's working on this as well. Um, and then the start of the week, week at least, we'll be working on squashing all of the remaining 9.0 bugs or punting on them if we don't want to do it. Uh, so that's where I'm at. 
Next up is Dan. Okay, um, I in the course of debugging some NRF bugs, I fixed a storage leak in the Adafruit BLE library that'll be merged in uh, soon after review, I assume. Um, uh, I added a finalizer for ESP camera to fix some, some issues with uh, playing tones on the Memento camera board. And I'm looking at uh, all the remaining 900 bugs and uh, figuring out what to do with the ones that I have the most expertise on. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Next up, I have notes from DJ Devin 3 who says, finished the 3D model of the 64 by 32 5 millimeter pitch matrix panel. The model is now available on principles and in Adafruit CAD parts. For those who want to design your own bracket, having the model available makes it much easier. Revamped my Fitbit API project to be more stable during Wi-Fi and power outages. Updated the code from 8.2.2 to 8.2.10 without issue. Designed and ordered a new PCB with eight slim switches for mounting in enclosures. Will take about two weeks to arrive. This week, I'm redesigning my 3D printed three and a half inch TFT featherwing enclosure and adding more shelving and cabinets for storage in my workshop. For some reason, my workbench is always littered with microcontrollers. Having more horizontal surfaces to store things is always a good idea. I feel that for sure. Next up, uh, we have notes from 80CC. It says, uh, continue USB debug with Arg and Blue. Implementing a new wrap trace buffer for debug. Useful for low level debugging with min minimal interference. And continue BLEIO for RP2 development. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, last week, I submitted a PR that adds a support to Pi Camera Library for being able to scale the, the overlays, which I worked on the week prior. Um, this allows you to either use uh, frames or borders that are a different size from the actual photo that you're taking the picture for, but scale it up or down. Uh, or if you use uh, like sticker images, you can scale those up or down to fit your photos. If you want an uh, amusing example of that, I pasted one in the um, note stock of a little Lego robot with some nice uh, glasses on that I used that feature for. Um, I did uh, last week a bunch of reviewing of uh, older library PRs and uh, moved forward the ones that I could. Um, I fixed uh, circup instructions across a bunch of libraries. Uh, there was a period of time where Cookie Cutter, I think, had a bug in the libraries that got created during that time. The circup instructions in the README was uh, slightly wrong, so I went through and fixed a bunch of those last week. Um, I, uh, over the weekend, started on this. I uh, circled back to the web workflow support for Circup, uh, made changes based on the last feedback that was there, as well as found a couple other issues and fixed them, and uh, a few other improvements that were submitted as part of that um, as well. Uh, I got a M5, uh, I don't know if it's M5 stack or just M5, but M5 card pewter device um, last week. I figured out how to flash Circuit Python on it, as well as how to flash it back to the demo code that it came preloaded with. Um, and uh, what I want to look into on that device, which is my last item as well for this week, is uh, trying to write some Python level mockup code of how the keypad API could work uh, in order to kind of have it add support for using either rows or columns that are, uh, I don't know if multiplexed is the right term, but the uh, it actually only uses three pins, but there's a shift register so that there's eight total outputs and then those represent the rows and then it has column pins like normal. So. Um, it's not quite set up to handle it, um, but it's not actually that hard to do. Um, so I'm looking into the Python code for that, uh, and that's what I have got. Thanks. Thanks, Wemmy Guy. All right, next up is Jeffler. Hi again. I was out last week, but I did do a little circuit Python work. In a branch, I made it possible to use the core's SSL implementation on WizNet Ethernet, which um, use, is a SPI-connected Ethernet device that implements the TCP and UDP protocols. So that's kind of cool. The uh, downside is it uses up most of the remaining uh, space, firmware space. Uh, for instance, on the Feather RP2040, that makes the firmware area about 95% full overall. So I think we're not likely to enable this generally. This is a pretty niche feature to spend about 200K of uh, flash space on. Uh, but I would still like to see it merged and enabled uh, on one particular board. 
Wiznet makes a Pico form factor board that also has an Ethernet port on it. Um, so that will that will come at some point, I hope. Uh, but this week it is more centered around Adafruit products that we're working on. So I will be in the Adafruit land working on support for MFM floppy writing. Um, the status of that when I put it down uh, Friday before last is that I could write data that um, I generated the MFM encoding for and read it back with my code, but it doesn't read um, on a USB fl floppy reader. So um, I just need to sort out what is the what are the differences and fix them until it reads on my USB uh, floppy drive. Uh, the hope is eventually that uh, this code can be pulled into CircuitPython, um, although we'll have to see how that goes. Again, it probably adds a lot of code that's a fairly niche usage. It also needs a lot of RAM, so it is really not a super practical appliance. Um, but anyway, in CircuitPython world, my plans for this week, um, when I need downtime from the floppy project, I will look at getting the SSL code closer to being uh, pull requestable. And also I have a couple of uh, issues to work on for version nine. And incidentally, I did just reproduce um, some problems accessing slash SD. So uh, Melissa, thank you for reporting that problem, hug report, um, and more on that as it comes. Thanks, Jeff. All right, next, uh, let's, next let's go to Jerry. Okay, um, so I spent a lot of time this week working on the combined uh, radio module library to combine the RFM 6.9 and 9x libraries. Uh, so now I've pretty much got all the functionality that both of the libraries had combined now into one, and it all, all works the way it did before. It just all you have to do to run the examples is to make a really minor change to the to the actual, uh, you know, uh, calls to set it up. But um, and then so now I'm, I'm trying to add some stuff. And my big breakthrough of the week was to be able to add uh, FSK support to the RFM 9X, because right up now it only it only is set up for LoRa. And um, what that enables me to do is have an RFM 9X actually talk to an RFM 6.9. Uh, even though the product guide says they can't do that, they do mm -hmm. just fine as long as they both do a F a FSK. Um, so that that's kind of fun. And that means that you know, people have both of those usual modules now can actually communicate between them. And um, my, my next part of the whole thing is to now take the uh, Radiohead um, support or compatibility and make that an option, make it the default still, they'd probably leave it that way, but enable the, someone to turn that off so that it just writes raw packets out. And then on the FSK mode, the um, both the RFM 69 and the 9x support have built in addressing node addressing filtering for packet um, so you can use that um, if you send raw packets so my goal is to get that up and running and that will then allow um, these units to be used with the other Arduino libraries that are out there radio live or low power labs that, that don't have any particular header um, so uh, making progress and, and having fun with it Awesome. Nice update. Thanks, Jerry. Next yeah. up is Justin. Yeah, uh, just some stats if people are curious. So uh, almost everything on Connection Manager is merged at this point. Um, in the end, I touched 25 repos. There was 46 PRs and um, about 3,000 lines added, 2,000 removed. Um, so just kind of interesting to see where all something like that touched. Um, over the weekend, I put together a playground note, uh, which was both fun to play with playground and whatnot and everything and just kind of put it out there. Um, I know a couple of people have looked at it already. Um, after I did that, I started digging into Circup because I hadn't actually used it before. Um, found the issue that uh, Dan mentioned earlier and things like that. So I opened up a couple of PRs into there. And at this point, I'm going to get back into some of my own libraries around time and config and probably continue to watch um, the help with channel and see um, what might be my next kind of fun thing to really kind of dig into as I watch the connection manager stuff kind of settle. Sounds good. Thanks, Justin. Next up is Liz. All right. Uh, last week, I worked on a circuit Python project using OpenAI with the Memento camera board. Uh, Memento takes a photo, converts it to base 64, uploads to OpenAI, and OpenAI returns a response based on the prompt provided. 
Uh, it was really baffling in a good way how accurate the responses were, especially for things like translating text to English. Uh, I know there are a lot of opinions about AI, but this feels like a helpful use case. Uh, when we think about like accessibility, how it could go out to there. Uh, and the guide is live now. And this week I'll be working on a product guide for the new Stemma analog switch that just went into the shop. I also have a couple of projects on deck that will be coded in CircuitPython. One is a Feather battery monitor charger, and another is controlling an Elgato light over Wi-Fi. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Uh, and last up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, it was a short week, so I was visiting family, but I worked on fixing some of the Raspberry Pi installer scripts uh, backwards compatibility bugs. Um, I fixed a bug in Blinka Display I.O. that was causing it to fail as a number was that was expected to be an integer was converted to a float under certain conditions. Uh, and I'm, I continue working on the Pi Eyes project and I'm working on uh, desktop buffer scaling at the moment. And that's where I'm at. Thanks, Melissa. <clears throat> and thank you everybody for your status updates. Uh, the last section that we have here is in the weeds. Um, this is a chance to have any longer form discussions that we want to have. Um, I just added a topic. Um, if anybody else has topics as well, feel free to add them below me. Uh, but I wanted to just check in with Dan. Uh, do we need to have a discussion about how this should work? Um, the background for folks listening is that I have a PR out that changes the way file system writability works. So previously, you had the storage remount something um, in order for Python to read and write it. But um, the changes I made actually allow, if you're not on USB or USB hasn't come up, up yet, it allows you to re write files and potentially block USB from being writable. Um, so Dan, do you want to just give me an update on what you found there? And do we need to make some decisions around that? So I, um, I did a test where I wrote a program that just opened a file immediately and wrote it. And it beats USB to the punch. So that means that it can write the file and then CircuitPy is read-only USB, which is not the semantics that we've had before at all. Right. And so I just I said, well, maybe we need to go back to the regular semantics okay. um, on this. I mean, I think the, the underlying locking code is it, it's cleaned up considerably, but for the case of competing with USB, I don't think that it right. should be the case that depending on the timing of your program, USB is, is or is not read-only. Seemed not the greatest. I'm just curious what issue this addresses. Uh, the changes were done because uh, wet on web workflow, it wasn't writable, even if you were on uh, USB. OK. I noticed that. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. So so I fixed that. But the problem is, is I went a little too aggressive, and I made the writing from Python code work the same way. <laughs> so I think gotcha. I think we want the workflows to be like a bit more dynamic like this, but we don't want user code to be. Um, and so I just I got a little, um, a little, a little aggressive, like I said. <laughs> but yeah, so this. OK, thank you. Yeah, so this fi this this fix was done because somebody noticed that like if you have you know your Wi-Fi device plugged in and uh, you still wouldn't be able to edit it without the storage remount or the or the disable stuff. So. I I mean I think the reason that it works for web workflow and internally in Python is that those things make atomic transactions to the file system. Whereas when it's USB, it's not those the the blocks that are being written from USB are not part of a, some transaction mechanism. So that's right. why you have to block, lock out USB completely. I mean, that's the explanation for this. Right. Yeah, there's no way to enable USB writes and do that safely because you can never tell when USB is done. Right. Unfortunately. But you, you could have the same race condition between using the web workflow. If you're if you're writing a file or creating a file from web workflow and USB is enumerating, you could have the same thing happen. But I think that it's a lot less likely than than this weird okay. code case. So 
Okay, I'll undo that. Or the same file, maybe, or something, yeah, so. Um, it's just a matter of, like, whether anything is grabbed with a block device lock while USB is deciding whether to be read-only or not. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll change it back. I will and remind everyone that the reason all, for all this is because Mac o because Apple refused to implement something called media transfer protocol <laughs> because it competed with iPods. Right. <laughs> we could live in a better world where USB drives worked at the file system, uh, above the file yeah. system, not below it. Yeah. All right. So that is the first item. And I see Foamy Guy added another one. And I'm, I'm curious for an update about this. So let's go to Foamy Guy next. Yeah, I had a just a quick question. We saw this issue pop up on the Feather DVI. Basically, somebody noticed that the old demo code was having an out-of-memory exception. And uh, what it boiled down to is that device, it um, initializes the display automatically inside the board in it. So it comes up as board.display, just like you know, Pi Portal or anything else with a built-in display. Um, but the demo code, I think, might have been written before that was actually the case, back when it maybe did not initialize it automatically in the core. And so the demo code had released displays and it initialized the display, you know, quote unquote, manually. The kind of crux of my question is, in a scenario where a device initializes a display automatically in board init, and then CodePy turns around and immediately releases the display and then attempts to reinitialize it, uh, would that be expected to work always, I guess? Because it seems to me like it should release the memory that was used when it was automatically initialized, so then it should have enough memory to initialize it again. Uh, so it makes me think maybe it's not actually releasing everything when it gets released, but I also don't know if that simplistic view of it is really how it works or not. I think it's tricky, and it's definitely trickier in 9. Um, okay. because it depends on where you're allocating and, and nine is going to be more susceptible to fragmentation. Um, and I don't remember if like, so you're allocating a big buffer. I don't remember whether we allocate that back into the outer heap or not. So like when you're, when you do board in it, the VM's not up, so you're going to allocate it outside of the VM heap. And I think if you run it during the VM, you're probably still not allocating to the heap. But if anything else has gone and gotten into that spot that you freed in that time being, you risk like the big spot where you hope to allocate again being smaller and then failing your allocation the second time. Um, okay. So it sounds like that could, like, it, it may not always be the exact same on every device, but it could, that may not really be a, a bug necessarily indication. Yeah. I mean, it's good to check, like, your intuition of, like, maybe something's not being freed, I think is fair. <laughs> like, it's all, it's all manual memory management, so it's totally possible that something's not being freed. Um, but, like, okay. I could imagine a, like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It would take um, some. There's a debug print that could help you. Um, but yeah, just it would take more analysis of like, okay, this this chunk was allocated for this big frame buffer, and then like this one other random small thing got allocated in that chunk before we had a chance. Um, I got gotcha. you. But the okay, the outer heap should be pretty smart in terms of matching sizes. So it was, I would hope it do it do a better job. I will do a uh, kind of quick like sanity check because uh, I have not actually looked at the numbers. I just know that it was raising the error when you went to initialize it. So I'll do a, an actual check and look at the numbers and see if it's kind of different enough that it looks um, suspicious or for maybe just um, having like one of the imports or something occupying some of the space where it was or something like that. Yeah, I guess what I would say is do release displays as close as possible to reinitializing it to like minimize the amount of other stuff that's going to happen between the two things. 
Oh, between those two? Okay. I'll take a look at the code. I think they were, I'm, I believe I think, they were one after another. I think they usually are, yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they were. It it was there was uh there's like an if statement in the original code because it was it's written to handle the feather DVI or just a Pico that has I guess like a breakout uh, DVI breakout or something. It must be. Yeah. So the only thing between release and initialize was the kind of beginning of the if statement. So they were pretty close together, but. Hmm. I will. Uh, I will see. I'll check the actual numbers and see what's getting reported, and see if it seems like there's an obvious chunk missing or not, and okay. uh, can go from there. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's all really tricky, especially when you're allocating really large chunks, because fragmentation okay. can kill you pretty quick if uh, yeah. if you need something big to fit. Um, if you or Dan happen to have a moment sometime, if one of you can take a look at that learn guide uh, PR just to see if that kind of cause and effect hypothesis actually makes sense for what we saw there. Right. Um, yeah, I have it, I have it open. I'll look at it later today. Cool. I saw, it go, I saw it go by and I was curious about it. So yeah, we'll get there. That right. covers it. Thank you. Thanks, Family Guy. And uh, thanks, Liz, as well, for looking at that right now, too. OK. Uh, and that is it for the CircuitPython weekly meeting uh, for March 4th. 2024. I am stalling as I get back to my notes. Um, thank you, everybody who's participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Uh, it looks like next week is also on schedule. Um, the next meeting will be next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Discord. Um, the meeting. <laughs> I'm, I'm going out of order. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter next week. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Um, oh, and Jeff has a note that uh, note that the U.S. changes to summertime next weekend. So if you're not in an area that follows the same DST rule, uh, AKA if you're not in the US, it's likely that the time will change for you next week. Um, so thanks, Jeff, for that note. Um, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join anytime uh, by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And with that, um, <laughs> the time will be 2 p.m. in UTC minus 4, which is a confusing way to talk about it. Um, anyway, hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.